welcome once again to The Blueprints. It's Canada's conservative podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Schmail, Member of Parliament for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Thank you once again for joining us. We've got a great show, as usual, lined up for you today. We're going to talk about housing and the incentive to try to get into the home ownership market and the problems and the barriers people are facing as they get into it. So as we do the show, although some people might not be able to watch the whole thing live on Facebook, we ask that you, again, like, comment, subscribe, share this program, help us push back against the ever-moving liberal agenda, maybe maybe get into some of your networks where we can uh, hit voters who are open to hearing the conservative message, and that's why we need your help too. And if you can't watch it all today on Facebook, you can download it later on platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google Play, you name it, it's out there, and it's great content with amazing guests, and this week, we have a returning guest, a good friend of the program. We have Brad Viss, the Member of Parliament for Mission Matsqui, Fraser Canyon in beautiful British Columbia. He's also the Shadow Minister for Housing. Brad, thank you again for coming on the program. Jamie, I am honoured to be here today with you. Thank you so much for inviting me, my friend. You're always full of energy. That's why we have you on the program. So let's get right into it. Housing. We know it's a problem for pretty much anyone, unless you're uber rich, to getting into the market or moving around within the housing market. We have... Through the pandemic scene, the price of real estate in in my area start to skyrocket because people are leaving the cities and coming into the suburbs, into the rural areas, which again is driving up the price, supply and demand. And uh, the Liberals came up with, because of the pandemic, came up with a program, a few of them. Let's start with the Rapid Housing Initiative. That's a billion dollars to try to get people that can't or aren't into housing now into it as fast as possible. Maybe you can quickly give us a quick synopsis of the program and, and some of the concerns we have as an opposition and some of the solutions you have as critic. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so a few months ago, the um, Minister Hussein announced a uh, $1 billion fund to create up to 3,000 permanent affordable housing units across Canada. Um, when the program was announced, I know a lot of housing providers were excited about it, uh, a program that was going to cut the red tape, uh, get the money out the door really, really quickly, uh, trans uh, go forward a few months, and the minister makes another announcement and said, well, actually, there's only $500 million that you can apply for. The other $5 million has been allocated to uh, big cities across Canada. I think uh, Surrey, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal uh, received the lion's share of funding. But the rest of the country can apply for the other $500 million through a cumbersome application process. And in addition, we're not actually going to have those 3,000 units built in six months, as we promised. Uh, it's actually a double that. We need to see that com uh, construction completed in 12 months. So if you're take a step back and you like I'm in Mission, British Columbia right now in Mission the homelessness population has doubled uh, since the last uh, uh, count by the by the district. Um, for a smaller municipality, say in, in, in any rural community across Canada, where homelessness and uh, drug and mental health addictions issues exist as well, uh, they don't have the staff, they don't have the resources to even put towards a program that they might get funding for. So I, I think it was a little dishonest of the Liberal government to say they're going to build 3,000 units really rapidly and it's going to be available for all people. The reality is, is that communities that you represent, Jamie, and communities, many of which are in my riding too, in rural Canada, uh, don't aren't going to be able to access those funds because they just don't have the manpower, even though uh, there is a need uh, for that to take place. Um, so, and I, and I'd also point out that when all of those those funds were given to Toronto and Vancouver, where the need is real, where was the government uh, for the north of Canada? Uh, I just heard from the uh, minister, the, the minister uh, responsible for housing in the Northwest Territories. And we all know that in the north of Canada, the housing needs are more acute. 
where was the government's program for the territories to uh, house people up there where the conditions are way more severe than anywhere else in the country? They, they have no answers um, on that program. Well, they did have a program. Those, on they had needs. one program. It was the equity uh, sharing program. Which was oh. if, for 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 people if who might uh, might be tuning in and may not hear about this. They announced this a few budgets ago, where the federal yeah. government would invest in your house. They would basically take a ten percent up to ten percent ownership of your house. Now, that ten percent grows with the value of your home. So you your share of the what you owe the federal government, which you will have to give them back, starts to grow as the value of your your investment grows. And uh, maybe you can talk about that because that was not picked up anywhere near. And I think we as the opposition pointed that out in the last parliament, that this program would be a a failure and would caution people because who wants the government owning a piece of your home? Yeah, you know what, you're you're right on the mark there. And I remember doing a town hall as the uh, conservative candidate in advance of the 2019 election, uh, pointing out that very po- that that very fact, and if I remember correctly, Evan Sedol and the Liberals insisted that this program, this equity sharing program with the federal government, would help 100,000 uh, Canadians buy a home, and the CMHC set a target for uh, for the program's first six months uh, of operation of 20,000 households. And just yesterday, actually, I got an order paper question back, and. Uh, and it's very evident that Canadians don't want the government owning part of their house. And the program's only helped uh, uh, 5,298 people in seven months. And, uh, and it, but this is, this is the key statistic. Um, only 66% of the people approved actually took the loan because when they realized that the government was going to own their primary asset, the majority of Canadians thought, you know, that doesn't sit well with me. Why would I want Justin Trudeau and the Liberals owning my uh, my house? Um, what's what's very interesting is that in Vancouver, there was only a single person that that used this program. One person in all of Vancouver, and in Toronto, it's not much better. There was only sixteen people. Sixteen people. So th- sixteen people in, in Toronto, all, and one so, in Vancouver. One in Vancouver. Wow. So this was supposed to be the Liberals' big answer to housing affordability and the real uh, challenges that Canadians face uh, in some overpriced markets, but it was a big fail. And, uh, you know, I've spoken to the mortgage professionals of Canada recently, and they said, they, they outlined the same uh, uh, sentiment that you did, that why do I want, why would a consumer want the government of Canada owning part of their primary asset? And they said, well, we could achieve the same types of savings uh, that people that do qualify this program by doing what we proposed in the last federal election. And that's increase the amortization for first-time buyers from 25 to 30 years, only for first-time buyers. That would achieve the same relative savings uh, for a first-time home buyers than the um, out-of-touch, liberal, uh, government-knows-best approach. Well, as, as most people know, and those trying to get into the housing market for the first time or otherwise do realize that, that owning a home is, is almost the essence of freedom, right? You, you get to have yeah. your, your building, your structure, or your piece of land. You can build on it. You can grow things on it. You can do a lot of things, obviously within reason, but it is the essence of freedom. And that, that, uh, that equity that you gain through the, the, the purchase of, of property allows you to climb the economic ladder, allows you to do investments, allows you to improve it, and, and allows the, the, the rising of the tide, if you will, uh, of, of people trying to climb the economic ladder. So the government, when they put roadblocks from people acquiring housing, that's a significant barrier because when, when the government doesn't allow people to get into that, that, that market, you almost make it harder for people to to lift themselves up or climb the ladder itself. Yeah. And you know, Jamie, what's even worse is that I was uh, sitting around having a cup of tea with my mother the other day, and uh, she's a retiree. She's in her late 60s, and her home that she owns outright, it's a, it's a modest townhouse in Abbotsford in a 35 or 50 plus um, age uh, restriction unit. And, um, and when she heard 
that the liberals were studying the possibility of taxing that equity, she she lost it. I I she was legitimately concerned. So and uh, and that's what I'm really concerned about too is that we're going to see some taxes on middle class, hardworking Canadians that put everything into that house to achieve that freedom, to have those options and that security for their family. And uh, we don't know what the Liberals are going to do, but I, I don't think it's going to be uh, necessarily in the best interest of homeowners. Well, doesn't that scare you? Now, now think about this for the second. So uh, the, during the last election, the Ontario Liberal Caucus put forward a series of ideas to the National Council to consider as their platform. And one of that, as you just mentioned, was the taxation of the proceeds on the sale of your primary residence, something that is not subject to that kind of taxation level. Now, that continued. There's been a number of articles in a bunch of mainstream media outlets. There's also been, as you mentioned, a study by the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation on that very issue. Not only that, just coming out this past week, there was another report from, I believe, Deutsche Bank, who suggested taxing people who are staying at home because you are not going out and about and actually providing the revenue for government that it needs. So on one hand, you have government with massive spending, the taxation yeah. level coming down because businesses are closing or have closed or have locked down or have slowed down. The economic activity isn't there. So the revenue isn't coming in, but you have the big spending. So you need to pa collect that the, the, the money to pay the bills somehow, although Justin Trudeau is printing a lot of that through the uh, central bank. Um, this this is kind of uh, concerning if if you're said stay home be safe but we're going to tax you potentially you know this is just a study but they're they're looking for ideas on how to to find new sources of revenue and of course the carbon yeah. tax went up so this is extremely concerning if if these roadblocks are keeping people out of the housing market market yeah and uh, i would say too that we're about to uh, realize a cpp uh, increase as well that the liberals instituted that's going to hit uh, businesses and individuals pretty hard in the new year um, but on that point, uh, I, I was in the House of Commons two weeks ago, and I had the opportunity to debate on C4, the Minister of Finance. I asked her repeatedly, why has the government not updated their reporting of public accounts? Why has the government failed to give Canadians clarity on a budget? Why has the government not followed through with the level of transparency that our parliamentary budget officer uh, said was needed for Canada's economic recovery? It's because they're looking at new ways that they can tax Canadians, that they can uh, penalize people who made responsible decisions. That's what I'm very afraid of right now. And that's why we got to keep our guard up and we got to keep pushing them in the House of Commons on all of their government program spending and, and whether it's actually serving the best interests of Canadians in a timely way. Well, not just housing, Brad, I think you touched on it just a second ago. It's not just housing that's going up. Uh, it's everything, the cost of groceries, home heating yeah. fuel, everything is going up. And I'm hearing, and I'm sure you are too, that the cost of living is just getting overwhelming right now while paychecks are not ra raising to the level that allows people to to comfortably live in a lot of cases. And, and, and a lot of that, of course, has to do with the pandemic, but it also has to do with the fact that the taxes on these products keep increasing, such as the carbon tax that went up in, in the middle of the pandemic. That put more of a strain on the cost of groceries, on heating, on fuel itself, which is often used in many, many cases, pretty much all, to get the products from either the, the farm, where they have to pay a tax to dry the, the, the crops, to the, the uh, warehouse, to the Grow, the end user, the retail outlet, or to the consumer, all of that has a cascading increased effect. Yeah, and I know that all too well in British Columbia, where I live, we have by far the highest carbon tax in Canada. And we also have by far the highest cost of living in the country as well. And let me tell you, if Canadians were paying less taxes on the goods that they purchase that are necessary for their family's well-being, there would be more young Canadians able to enter the housing market sooner. Taxation, uh, the, high, the, the higher, consumption, uh, higher consumption taxes, carbon taxes, all prevent younger Canadians 
from having the liberty to save up and put more away towards their first home. And that affordability equation is so key to our economic recovery and, um, and what we do to help Canadians enter the housing market. So Brad, I know you're working yeah. hard and so is the caucus on coming up with, with some ideas to continue on with into the next coming weeks, months, potentially into the next campaign. Um, our leader, Aaron O'Toole, laid out a series of ideas on housing within his leadership platform. Is there anything you're able to to share with us on on how, how you know, what potentially could be ahead and what the Conservatives will be proposing as an alternative to what the Liberals are doing? Yeah, well, one thing um, I was reading some of the housing statistics on Canada this morning in preparation for our discussion today, and despite being in a national in a pan, in a global pandemic, um, I I learned that the average home price in Canada has now reached over six hundred thousand dollars, and that's an eighteen percent increase uh, over last year. And in the housing statistics, I. Um, I read it said that there is still a lot of demand and foreign investment in our residential housing market. Um, so I think as, as in British Columbia right now, where there is a commission going on about money laundering and the impact that has partly on the housing sector. But there, there's a lot that we can do uh, to make sure that Canadians come first in purchasing a home in Canada, uh, that maybe we we look closely about how, it, as we do in British Columbia and in Ontario as well, how we tax uh, foreign buyers trying to enter the market. When I speak to young conservatives in Vancouver, they they implore me to take action to make sure that they have a better opportunity than a foreign investor being able to get into their their first home so i'm looking closely at that another area that i'm looking closely at is uh incentivizing the creation of rental stock in our market um, so i know our leader campaigned on a promise to uh, review how capital gains are used on reinvesting in rental properties i think that's a very solid idea um, there's a lot of proponents in the industry as well that are seeking uh, gst rebates uh, for those that are entering uh, or, or developing rental housing uh, so we need to look very very closely at building the type of housing stock uh, that's going to serve the interest of, of Canadians uh, first and foremost um, finally there is as you know the the Liberal government did announce in their th speech from the throne that they wanted to completely eliminate housing uh, sorry homelessness in uh, Canada and part of that was going to be done through their uh, national housing uh, policies. Uh, a big part of that is the uh, the co-investment fund uh, put forward by the government and what we've heard and and seen in Parliament and from stakeholders all across Canada is that again uh, the Liberals primary program uh, to help build stock for for long term care. Uh, for seniors that need housing, uh, to work with non-for-profit housing societies across Canada, that, that main conduit with CMHC, is that the program isn't working very well. And I know uh, both you and I in committee were asking Evan Sadal on, on some of the numbers from CMHC and the programs they've actually approved, and we weren't able to get those answers, unfortunately. Um, but we're going we're gonna to continue pushing on that even this afternoon when we go into uh, committee together. But what, what I've heard from stakeholders and uh, Canadians that are really, really trying to make a difference and build stronger communities, and that's what the Conservative Party is all about, is that government programs right now are not working for them. Uh, for example, the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association, uh, not an organization, uh, well, an organization that encompasses uh, many, many non-for-profit housing providers across Canada. They're saying that just to do an application <clears throat> for the government program, they're not getting responses for over a year. Uh, there's no uh, standards applied uh, to the public servants and the CMHC officials in um, processing their application uh, for, for housing providers, uh, for community groups that have put, up, put a lot of capital up front uh, to develop a project. Uh, to lack that certainty from the federal government is really, really detrimental. So we need to take a really hard look, look at the National Co-Investment Fund 
how those funds are being dispersed and, and what projects are being approved and how long those projects are taking to get approved. So we really, really need to take a hard, hard look. I've heard in my own community that it's just not, the, the program is just too cumbersome to even apply for. Uh, it doesn't, it, it's, it's, it's not easy to do and people are frankly uh, very uh, upset with it. Um, so we need to we need to adjust that. We need to help first time home buyers. Uh, we, we need to look at uh, taxation and how it relates to affordability. And but first and foremost, we need to ensure that all of our policies are designed in a way that are helping Canadian families have a foundation for success. I think as conservatives, uh, we want to build up individuals and families to make good choices. And in order for them to make good choices, we need to make sure that our policies and programs are responding directly to their needs. And we need to just really take a bird's eye view of these government programs and readjust them to be more responsive and accountable to the people that are paying for them in the first place. Well done, Brad Viss. That is a perfect way to end it, unless you have anything else to add because question period is coming up and we don't wanna take away from, from that. Yeah, I'm going to add, we got, I see a question period is going to start in uh, five minutes here. Um, but just on your very first point about some of the changes we've seen since COVID-19. And um, I, I will say just more broadly speaking that in some respects, it's nice to see uh, more families moving to rural Canada and the vibrancy that's bringing and the quality of life that people are finding in um, mid-sized communities like Abbotsford, where I live, but also in other areas of my riding. In the Vancouver Sun this week, they talked about Lillooet. Uh, Lillooet is um, traditionally a forest community. Uh, there is a vibrant First Nations um, uh, the Statlian people there are doing great things economically and uh, more people are seeing these small rural communities and they're saying, hey, this is where I want to raise my kids because there is a, um, a great social fabric. You know your neighbors. It's a great place to live. And that's maybe one positive thing uh, we're seeing with these housing trends right now is that people are rediscovering rural Canada. And that's why we got to get a good uh, rural broadband policy so they can keep doing their jobs and, uh, and, 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 and make money for their families. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Brad Vish. This, sorry, Member of Parliament for Mission Matsqui Fraser Canyon, also the Shadow Minister for Housing, a good friend of the show, and always welcome on if you want to come on again. Jamie, thank you so much. Really appreciate the opportunity today. New content coming every Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Please feel free to join us each and every week. We will make an exciting show with lots of information you might not be hearing from the Main Street media. We have lots of interesting guests, information and conversation that you then are able to pass on to, to your friends and, and talk about the issues and, and help spread the conservative message and maybe even convince a, a member of your network or two that might be open to hearing that message. So please like, comment, share subscribe to this program if you can't watch it all today please download it later on platforms like Castbox, itunes google play spotify you name it it's out there together we can push back against the ever moving liberal agenda question period is coming up starting at 2 p.m eastern time feel free to join it our leaders page aaron o'toole as well as party headquarters will be sharing that feel free to stick around and as mentioned again new content every tuesday 1 30 p.m eastern time is when we go live once again, thank you for joining us. And as always, low taxes, less government, more freedom. That's the blueprint. Thanks for joining us. Keep rocking it, Jamie. <laughs>